You're listening to the CD Baby. CD Baby. CD Baby DIY Musician Welcome to episode number 48 of the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast. My name is Kevin, and this is a roundtable edition, so joining me is Chris and Robert. Hey, guys. How you doing? Hello. Hello. Very good. Well, uh, everyone having a, a good couple of weeks since we last met? Has it been that long? Yes, it has. Wow. Yeah, good. It's my birthday week. So. That's right. Right. That's, you're, what, you're 21 now? 21. <laughs> no. no. 33 and still no number one single, unfortunately. That's oh. all right. <laughs> Plenty of time. Just people, are living to like, people are living to 150 now, <laughs> so you can settle down when you're 100. Um, I had the chance to go down to Full Sail University last week and talk to some of the fine music business students down there. It was a lot of fun. And uh, I sat in on an artist management class, and they were asking for you know, advice with dealing with managers or as a manager. And one of the things I said was that you always have to remember that the manager is working for you, and not, you're not working for them. And right. you're, it's your career. It's not their career. And the reason I bring this up is because today I had the pleasure of talking to an artist lawyer down in L.A., and very much tables turned on that uh, that relationship there where it, it pretty much felt like the artist was working for the lawyer and and so it always frustrates me when when you have an artist who's got great music and then they surround themselves with people who kind of make it their thing and it's it's uh hijack the ship yeah hijack the ship and it's like i'm not sure whose best interests they have in mind at this point they're getting all huffy because you know the artist is having their own personality and their own thing. So, word of advice, it's your career, it's not theirs. Keep it in your own hands. <laughs> <laughs> so, moving on, we've got uh, some interesting news items since we last gathered, and unless you guys have anything else, we'll get right to that. No? All right, let's happy get to- Happy birthday. Uh, yes, okay. happy birthday. Should Thank we, you. The whole podcast world is singing a collective happy birthday to you right now. Should we pause <laughs> while they do it? <laughs> Oh, thanks, you guys. I know you're all singing out there. CD Baby. CD Baby. Music. Music. News. Well, you might have noticed that Facebook updated their terms and conditions for using their site. Well, after an enormous wave of complaints, Facebook reverted back to their previous terms and conditions until they can fix what they call confusing language. The main user complaint was that it appeared Facebook was claiming complete ownership over all content uploaded to the site, even if an account was deleted. Facebook says a revised version will be back up in a couple weeks. In more social networking news, we reported last roundtable edition of the podcast that Facebook had doubled the amount of monthly users of MySpace. Well, MySpace has some numbers of their own to be happy about. Comscore, who tracks these things, reported that in January, MySpace showed an all-time high in its minutes per visitor and the total minutes category. The social networkers page views also jumped to the highest level in more than a year. Um, the average MySpace user now spends 266 minutes, 4.4 hours, on the site every month, a 5% increase over last month, and a 31% increase year over year. MySpace says its users spend nearly 100 minutes more per visitor than the closest competitor. That's just because they can't figure out how to upload their photos. <laughs> <laughs> The ongoing saga for Pandora and other internet radio companies continues. The Digital Media Association confirms that negotiations with SoundExchange over net radio royalties did not yield any agreement before the February 15th deadline. The DIMA, on behalf of its members, which include Real Networks, Pandora, and MTV, have been negotiating with SoundExchange since March of 2007 when the Copyright Royalty Board increased some webcasters' royalties by 300%. Still no word on what exactly this non-decision means. And finally, an indie band by the name of Officer Roseland made headlines this past week with their launch of a website called MyStimulusPackage.org. 
Through the website, the band offers to pay music fans a dollar to download their new album called Stimulus Package. That's right, they'll pay you. Before you actually download the album, you're given two options, give or take. If you select give, they will give your dollar to the Mr. Holland's Opus Foundation. If you select take, they will pay you a dollar through PayPal. The band said, we're not independently wealthy and all the money is coming from the band, so we'll probably have to cut it off at some point. So it'll be interesting to see if they uh, get their money, their money's worth out of that promotion. And uh, that's the news items I... Cut it off now. (laughs) Oh my gosh, things have gone from sad to absurd. (laughs) You know, I don't think that's such a bad idea, but the the one bad idea about it that I think is a little bit dangerous is that they're giving away the dollar that people do give them because at least they could cover their behinds by being able to take that money if they do get a whole bunch of dollars donated to them and no, give it to all the people. Not, no, they're, they're not getting any, a dollar. They're paying a dollar. They're paying either way. It's just you can decide whether you want the dollar or the band should pay it oh, to, or it to the goes to the Mr. Holland Opus. Either way, they're paying a dollar. See, I thought they were saying either you they would pay you or you could pay them and you just got the choice. No, the, the, the give is... Instead of them paying you a dollar, they're going to give that dollar to Mr. Ho- uh, Mr. Holland's Opus Foundation. Oh. So you can either, basically they're saying, are you a greedy jerk or are you <laughs> interested in helping the, the arts? Well, either way, there's no sacrifice on the part of the customer or the, you know, not even a customer, they're not paying anything, the, the music fan. It's, it's crazy to me. So it's not lending that much value to the work, but... It is, you know, it's being podcast about by us. That's, so they're getting publicity. They're getting that's true. So mystimuluspackage.org is it's kind of an interesting setup. There were people giving them flack because they thought it was uh, gimmicky. And I'm like, well, of course it's a gimmick. <laughs> what do you think? But yeah. uh, isn't all marketing in some form a gimmick? Totally. I thought I, I, my friend has this thing where she... She's always uh, complaining about how musicians are not actually paid. They're paid in fun units. And that's basically the world's rationalization for not paying for music anymore, or for paying to go and get into shows. It's like, oh, well, you're playing music. You're having fun, right? So she quantified that as fun. We're earning fun units. So now we're not even earning those. We're paying to make we're music. We're paying fun units for our to give away our music. We're in negative That's fun horrible. units now. Yeah, so that was that was interesting. Well, I don't know if uh, we'll hear any more about that, but it was picked up on some popular blogs. You know, they might not be wanting so, so much success with this. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you never know. Might turn out to be a, an idea that other people uh, people grab grab onto. It and it works because their album name is Stimulus Package. I didn't listen to any of the music, but uh, or have them pay me a dollar. I kind of felt bad. I don't want them to pay me a dollar so i don't want their stimulus package i want to download it like a thousand times (laughs) that's true that's a good question if (laughs) if you can keep going downloading downloading (laughs) probably not hopefully they're smart enough for that um the myspace those numbers what what cracked me up about that i was like uh 4.4 hours the average person and i was kind of wondering okay how much of that is waiting for the pages to load <laughs> I know. and for all the ads to stop flashing around and how much of that is actual usage because that's always been my complaint with myspace maybe they're just slowing down everything loading but but uh, in order to increase the amount of time people are there but what if i just have myspace open in a window all day long uh I, it won't it won't count for that it, at some point usually within a, like a half hour I know with like Google Analytics, within a half hour, if there's non activity, it'll, it'll uh, like abort the the counting the minutes, mm-hmm. and uh, so it won't. You, so you can't get crafty and get a bunch of computers with your website up for days on end and uh, boost your numbers. And by the way, just I mean, a little bit off subject, but don't get too caught up in in web statistics that's something i'm learning a little bit more now at host baby that people get really concerned about their numbers their hits and their visits and look at your album sales look at the you know the people that are communicating with you and sending you emails and don't worry too much about all that stuff it'll it'll make you go crazy (laughs) yeah because you know to some extent there's they're just numbers you know sometimes you just got to go with your gut and know something's working exactly the thing with the internet radio, I, I still haven't found any information about uh, how this is going to affect folks like Pandora and, and real networks. And it's kind of all the all the articles just kind of say there wasn't a decision, but it doesn't say, well, what does that even mean for them? And uh, while I was at Full Sail University, uh, 
uh, last week I was on a panel with Tim from Pandora, and I know that they were kind of waiting for this deadline, and he ended up in, being on a conference call about it like really late at night, you know, just because they were all trying to negotiate this stuff up to the minute, and it seems like nothing happened. So uh, I don't know if it's back to the drawing board or, or what. Um, I'm hoping that uh, as time progresses, uh, people will get smart and realize that uh, Pandora and Internet Radio are a part of the future, and, and they, they've got to find a way to embrace it and make it work for both parties. And uh, Facebook, man, people were emailing us like crazy about uh, the Facebook terms and conditions. I was hearing about it from not just podcast listeners, but people here in the office and and whatnot. Uh, now, see, I just assume that I'm if I'm putting content on a website like MySpace or Facebook or whatever that you know it's it's out of my hands. Who knows where it's going to end up next? You know, I yeah. mean, I I understand that you know there's this sort of big brother aspect to some of these really huge companies and that you're putting your life story up there and you're, you know, but I just feel like if you're going to be doing that, if you're putting content online, especially in these, you know, sort of communities that like you're sharing it with the world and who knows where it's going to end up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Generally, even with most internet places, when you delete an account, it's not deleted. They don't wipe it clean. Your information's still there. There may be some that do, but for the most part, you know, if if you don't want information spread around, then don't post don't, it. <laughs> don't post it. Also, you know, it, things that people need to be a little more smart on that maybe they hadn't in years past is have separate email addresses that you just use for those, that kind of thing. You know, um, with Facebook, I read some of their clarifications and basically they were saying that when I upload a photo, well, all my friends can now see that photo. Right. And if someone tags me in a photo, just because I delete my account doesn't mean my photo goes so away. So when someone tags you in a photo, that means that they, like, attach your name to the photo? Yeah. And then it sort of, like, it comes up, like, when people look at your profile? Yeah, yeah. So, like, in Facebook, and that's where I think Facebook can be a little dangerous for some people after, you know, we appear in our part of the country, we had some teachers and some other people that got lost their jobs over some photos that appeared on Facebook. And in one instance, it wasn't even a photo that that person put up there themselves. They someone just, else uploaded it. You know, it was it was a teacher having a beer and someone else uploaded it and tagged them in it and they got fired for it. So, I mean, but they Facebook was saying that, you know, like if you upload a photo, it t- sends a notification to your friends and that photo's in their email and, and, and in their status history and and they can't go and delete stuff out of there so so the lesson is if you're a teacher don't ever ever drink yeah (laughs) anything ever maybe in a closet at home by yourself with the lights (laughs) off so you know that no one's taking pictures (laughs) so live in fear so facebook they reverted back to their uh, previous terms and conditions and uh they say that there's going to be a thorough revision coming out soon and uh, they of the op- con- of the contract, yeah, and they've opened it up for suggestions and feedback. So um, they're trying to be a little bit more uh, transparent. Right. On well, this I mean, one. I can imagine that it's you know not just you know people who are do things like photography and music for a living that might be uploading stuff to Facebook and might be saying, wait a minute, what kind of property rights do you actually have over the- this? Is my content is copyrighted to me? You know. Yeah. I don't think Facebook, while they're trying to, you know, do right by the customer, I don't think they're, they have these ulterior motives. We're going to use all this content for this purpose. Right. But you they're just, not, they're not going to steal your album and put it out on Facebook records. No, <laughs> no. But it's just, you never know with the internet, people get a little, you never know down the line who might buy Facebook and have ulterior motives or right. do something, but in general, I think they're, they want to create an environment that people want to use because if they don't, everyone will leave, you know. So I'm sure it'll all get worked out and we can all be happy Facebook right. users and again. And, you know, don't be afraid of, of putting your stuff out there. I, I, I think that, you know, you can people can get paranoid too. I, I yeah. I think that, you know, you got to be a musician, to be an artist, to be a performer, you got to get your stuff out there in front of the public eye and Internet's the way to do it. As Derek always says, obscurity should be your biggest fear, not, not, not piracy. piracy. Exactly. <laughs>
Well, let's move on to uh, do a little recap of our last episode where we talked about taxes and uh, got some good feedback about it. I, it was an episode I was looking forward to doing for a long time. I was worried that it um, could be boring, but Alan was did a great job of presenting the info, I think, in an informative way, at least for people that uh, may be a new problem for them to kind of get them pointed in the right direction and have a, a little bit of a grasp on it because I know it can... When you get those government forms, it's like, I don't know who designs those forms, but they're made by people who really don't want you to understand what they have to say. Right. <laughs> and the print is microscopic. Mm-hmm. And it just kind of, it's not a fun thing to have to deal with. Well, so. I think one of the most important things about hearing him talk was just list, you know, all the different ways that you can write things off. There's so many things you would, wouldn't even think of that are that you can write off. And if you are operating as a business you know i mean even if you're not you know even if you're not claiming taxes i think that thinking of your music career as a business and maybe when you are bringing in some income when you do get the 1099 you know to just be in that frame set so that you're saving every single receipt that you possibly can even if you're not going to write it off in the end who knows your tax accountant may say oh yeah you can write that off you know my accountant tells me that every year I bring in what I think is just this huge amount of, of, uh, of write-offs. And every year she says, it's not enough. You run your own business. Almost everything is uh, tax. What's the word? Uh, tax write-off? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Almost everything is a write-off if, you, uh, if you're running your own business. So she's, she's always on my case for adding more stuff every year just uh, so when you go out now here's one for you when you go out with the uh the booker after the show you stop by a gas station you buy him a pez dispenser can you write that off i think you can damn (laughs) (laughs) that sounds like uh, you do you do want to be careful because um there's a fine line uh, between you know irs goes through your taxes and or getting yourself audited there are some things that you want to cover yourself on and um, what if you set your guitar on fire on stage (laughs) and it catches your shirt on fire and you have to buy a new shirt you can't write that off unless it's just a costume that's the thing with clothing uh when i was touring professionally they and was doing my taxes Mm -hmm. with an accountant they they pointed out and alan mentions in the podcast that clothing it's only if it's like you have specific costumes that you only use. That's kind of the the big. But it's kind of like a, like something got damaged in the line of duty. Like like well, you would have been able place. to write it off because of your purchase in the first place, not because it burnt to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> that would be insurance. All right, all right. <laughs> um, but uh, I think you know things like clothing or or other things like um, mileage, which we have a comment we'll read in just a second by. Uh, former CDM baby employee and podcast listener who uh, left a comment about his uh, horrible experience. But it's a lot of things where it's like, could be iffy, where if you're riding off clothing, they'd be like, yeah, but is that really st- stage clothing? So if you're like, I bought a thousand dollars worth of clothes this year, I'm riding it off, right. that might get you audited. Yeah. So um, with everything, you know, you definitely want to see an accountant. But you can do stuff like you can write off, say you use your computer for 25%. 25% of the time you use your computer for work, the rest of the time it's for leisure. You can write off that 25%. And as well as your internet bill. Yeah, right. And 25% of your internet bill. But if you use your computer for more than business, you shouldn't write off the whole thing. No, and that's and that's another thing where if you definitely want to get an accountant, a CPA, somebody who's a licensed tax preparer to help you with those things, because that is where it, it gets tricky, and those are other things where you can you can find yourself getting audited. The one thing I, I comment I wrote down was um, to be careful on the depreciation. Alan was talking about that. Right. It's not as big of a deal, and now because the gear is so cheap, like he in his scenario he was talking about, you know, like project studios. You know, not that long ago used to cost like hundred thousand dollars just for like a a, a quality professional demo studio you right. know and so obviously you don't you're not going to make money that year so you don't want to write all that off the first year because it's not going to make any difference it's just right. going to be zero anyway so you would depreciate it over time so it'd be this and i think they do it over a five-year period so it'd be like every five years i'm going to take that chunk those, so those are the things that you know if you're going to do it that way 
talk to an accountant, let, let them help you uh, through that process because um, those are the kind of things, you know, that will end up with the experience like Trevor had. So let's read, read uh, Trevor's comment. Robert's going to read it for us. So um, Trevor wrote this comment on the website. He basically got audited, he sort of got into some trouble. He says, uh, it took almost a year of correspondence with the IRS to finally win my case. They're vague as to what constitutes as a legitimate mileage log, so I printed my calendar from 2005 from my website and sent them that, as well as the mileage worksheet I put together simply by Googling the distances between gigs and putting it all in chart form. The response from one of my caseworkers was that anyone can manufacture a website calendar and that I needed more proof. I asked them what sort of proof I needed, and they suggested some sort of odometer readout from oil changes, but since my van ran on natural gas and I don't need oil changes, I didn't have this sort of proof. After doing some research, I later confirmed that an, offic- that an official odometer reading is not necessary to claim mileage. Then a new caseworker changed the nature of the audit and pointed out that since I didn't make a sizable income, that my music in 2005 was considered a hobby, not a career. I explained to them that the investment that I made in my music in 2005 has allowed me to make most of my income in 2008 from music instead of a day job. Any other startup business has allowed a loss in the beginning and not to be considered a hobby. I still don't understand this part of his argument. But he said that it would be an exception if I had participated in any charity events. Well, we happened to have done that um, for a Katrina benefit that year, which was listed in the calendar I sent them. And for some reason, it helped my case. After almost a year and my case being transferred to about half a dozen unaccessible caseworkers, I finally won my case. This is not a process I wish to go through again, though I did learn a lot about the tax system. I think it would be helpful if the IRS had a better understanding of the musician's reality so that they don't set up a process which deters us from filing our taxes honestly. Is that Trevor Reichman? Yeah. Ah, the natural gas thing too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, it's, it's, it's not just musicians. That's the process for any sole proprietor who's making, you know, an income like a musician would. It could be somebody who, you know, has a photography business or just any sort of sole proprietorship. The taxes are the same way. It sounded like there he was getting the runaround, which it seemed like once you get audited and they have suspicion that they're going to come after you, then they would just start making up stuff. At yeah, the point. runaround. It sounded like Kafka's uh, The <laughs> Trial, I think. There, <laughs> there is no reason why whether or not he participated in any charity events should affect anything having to do with his taxes. Not yeah. like... Let's see how we can get him. Was he charitable? All right, we'll let y'all. Guess he's a nice guy. Yeah, it's a little bit of a horror story, but uh, I mean, just document everything as well as you can. And apparently, only less than one percent of the population actually gets audited. But people that do file, um, like sole proprietorships, have a higher percentage, a higher percentage, of getting audited. And uh, the mileage thing, the best thing to do, and, and Alan mentioned this in the interview is to go to the office supply store and they have these little mileage logs. Um, They, you know, they look like a checkbook type thing. Throw it in your glove compartment. Anytime you do anything for your your band, write down the starting mileage and the end mileage because that's typically what they expect to see um, records and things. It'd be hard. And, you know, I bet bet a lot of it just comes down to the sort of the sort of documentation that they're used to handling, you know, like they're not used to getting a printed out concert calendar and it seems kind of shady to them, even though it's just as easily put together as the log book or whatever. It just happens to be what they deal with at their day to day job. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's like a lot of, a lot of business is just giving people the information in the form they want to see it in. And that's why it's important to use, a CPA or a tax preparer for this kind of stuff because they'll put the information translated into IRS code for you. So when the IRS reads it, they understand what it means and exactly. they're like, okay, this is correct. Where if you try to do it yourself, you'll probably unknowingly misrepresent yourself yeah. and get audited and it sounds painful. I think I'd rather have another spinal tap or something <laughs> than go through that again. <laughs> go through that. So, um, yeah, so if you have any other tax horror stories, uh, please post them on the comment section of the podcast at uh, cdbapodcast.com. 
um, just click on this episode or our previous episode and leave them there. Or you can email us, info at cdbabypodcast.com, or our listener line is always available. And someday I'm going to memorize that number. (laughs) And and the listener line number is 206-426-5683. So if you want to weigh in on taxes or any news items that we had today, feel free to do so. All right. Well, <laughs> speaking of the listener line, CD Baby, CD Baby Podcast. Message line 206 426 The number you have dialed 206 426 Hi, Kevin. CD Baby Gang. This is Rich Palmer again, richpalmer.com. I'm calling in response to the uh, fella that. Uh, actually was on a recent episode on the round table asking about Twitter on the cell phone as well as any other uh, cell phone or mobile type services. There's actually quite a few out there and I've explored a few of them. I have a couple favorites and I have a few that aren't so good in my mind but may work better for others and so I won't really endorse any one or the other but uh, a couple to look at. First of all, Textmarks, textmarks textmarks.com. Uh, For instance, I do a lot of Second Life performances, uh, acoustic performances online for audiences that tune in either to the stream or in that 3D environment, and I've invited them to pick up my calendar of events through text marks by calling 41411, actually texting 41411 with the keyword Rich DeSoto, and they can get my calendar that way. It's kind of a handy little tool, and I can update it from my phone very quickly, it doesn't matter where I am. Nice nice little tool. Kadoink.com, K-A-D-O-I-N-K.com is another service, which also has some widgets uh, of various types that you can put onto your website, uh, and people can actually send some of your songs back and forth to other people. So if you want to put something up there that somebody would want to share with a potential new fan, they can actually send that through the widget. And it has some other SMS-type cell phone uh, capabilities. There's Moses.com. I've noticed a lot of the national and regional acts are using Moses, M-O-Z-E-S, dot com. Uh, Several, several out there. I I think it's just tie into what works for you and, um, you know, see how your group, your band, or you as an individual artist can uh, tailor those to, you know, the message you're trying to get out or the, the involvement, the interaction that you want with your audience. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Loving the show, guys. I, too, am a long, long time listener. I started listening from episode number one. And one of my favorite episodes still to date is the interview with uh, Dan Zane way back in the earliest days. So thanks for what you're doing. Rich Palmer, richpalmer.com. What's up? I want to say hello to all the podcasters out there. It's on the net, Dr. Bass uh, from Eternal Life Music. I've been on TV baby, for five years. And, uh... I just wanted to uh, ask, ask, leave a comment, something about getting royalties from Soundcast um, for your music played on, um, on on internet radio. Um, could you walk the listeners through that and tell them how to get your music played on internet radio in the submission process? Thank you. Hi, it's Melanie Ingram, singer-songwriter for RSP. We are located in North Carolina, current record it's called Dirty Angels. Um, early on in the career, when we were doing some of our first live outdoor shows, we thought we were real smart, all-female band. What worried about that wind factor? And I had on a sort of a long dress that needed to be weighted that kept blowing up, which was an ongoing problem all day long. So for you ladies, you know, if the wind doesn't always just play havoc with your vocals and you need some sort of a you know windscreen over your mic. But... Your clothes, and I topped it off with picking up a soft drink off the stage and proceeding to drink from it, you know, all so cool and everything, and there was a bee in there, so I drank the bee, and then I had to continue doing the song with a bee and trying to get rid of it, and it was absolutely ridiculous, but anyway, so I've I've learned, you know, it, it's not just when you forget your, you know, your instruments or your music on the wrong thing or all the kind of cool, you know, cool, fun mistakes that you've got listed on the CD Baby Fabulous site, but, you know, worry about the elements, rain, bees, your dress blowing up. <laughs> Mail and Ingram, R3, thanks a lot, love CD Baby, bye. 
<laughs> wait, wait, wait. How was she trying to get rid of it? I guess it was still alive in her did, mouth. <laughs> did she swallow it? I don't know. Yeah. Oh, man. I, I, there's so many reasons why I hate playing outside, and, and Bugs is one of them. So, yeah. So, Melanie, thanks for that, that call. And, uh, Rich, thanks for another phone call and some useful information. And yeah, that, that was really great. I, I, you know, there's no way that the three of us can really keep our fingers on every cool, useful tool out there for musicians. And uh, that's it's really great to have some people call in and offer some alternatives, and uh, we appreciate it. Yeah, so I'll have to check that out and uh, see what uh, interesting things you can do with them. Um, a little notice of what's to come on the podcast. I met with a uh, mobile marketing guy at Full Sail University and interviewed him for the podcast, and so it'll be interesting to mess with this and then do that podcast and see if we now I'll get hooked on that <laughs> yeah the uh were we going to talk about the middle caller yeah yeah okay. and uh the other caller I think he said his name was Dr. Bass I'm assuming Dr. that's Bass. not what his mom named him but Dr. Bass said uh I think what he's talking about was sound exchange and how to get paid by sound exchange he said soundcast but sound exchange anyone can go sign up with and um also, they pay for the usage of the recording on the internet, but also ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, they collect royalties as well. So uh, you'll want to be a member of one of those organizations as well. So you want to be like a member of Sound Exchange, but then either a member of BMI or, or ASCAP. Yes. Or ASCAP. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Or CSAC, yeah. that's mostly yeah. Canadian, right? CSAC is, yeah, and Europe and whatever, actually. He, I think he also was sort of curious about how to just get your music played on internet radio, right? Yeah, and most of those places, it's just, you know, a lot of them on their websites have information about submitting music, so I would check that out. Yeah, like, start with Pandora. Pandora, they they uh, have information on their website. They only take about 30% of the music that's submitted to them, but uh, that's a good place to start. And then the other companies, you know, generally like on their website, it'll say how to submit because they, you know, they want lots of music because their their playlists are a lot more robust than right. your average radio station playing, you know, up through 40 songs for the month. <laughs> and now Last FM, do you, can you submit directly to them or do you usually have to get delivered? I believe you, you can. can do it either way. You, either way? Mm -hmm. Okay. I know I plug the Indie Bible every fifth episode or so, but that book actually has um, radio stations broken down into genre too. So, you know, if you're a jazz artist, you just, you look up jazz and then it breaks it into region. You could say North American jazz stations and then start researching those and see if you want to send your music there. Oh, and uh, Rich Palmer also mentioned the Dan Zanes interview. That, that still is... A very relevant interview. We did, that was one of the, I think that, that was, was our, our very first, first interview. Yeah. It wasn't the first episode, but it was the very first interview that we did for the podcast. I was super nervous. Uh, we both were. You should have seen the setup we had for that. And it was at the uh, place where Dan played here in town after the show. And so it wasn't. I, was, I, 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 you did the interview, but I was just fumbling with the microphone, <laughs> hoping I didn't <laughs> break anything. You probably weren't as nervous as Kevin was for the Duff interview, though, right? Right. No, I wasn't nervous for that one. Really? No, I actually wasn't. I, not. I, I was really nervous for the Dan Zanes one, but that's yeah, a good interview. Um, great advice. What Dan did is is exactly the the DIY route as far as going out there meeting people to sell his album so if you haven't listened to that episode it's episode number four i believe if not it's number three go back check it out it's a good one all right you've got a couple emails there why don't we hit those and then we'll wrap things up yes sir um we had an email from Ryan States. Um, he says that he's an um, indie songwriter producer and he's interested in sort of starting his own self-publishing business um, in order to produce his own CDs, CDs of his friends and that sort of thing. He was looking up on the uh, No Lows Music Law. Is that a book, No Low? Uh, it's a website. It has okay. a lot of useful w law information. And uh, it says that you can, you know, you can set up your own business fairly easily for twenty-five to hundred dollars. But then it says um, you need to see a county clerk. You need to get the contents in um, published in a local paper. You need to open a business bank account. Um, you need to, you know, apply for a federal tax ID and all this sort of stuff. And uh, he just wants to wants to know if he needs to what he needs to do and if he needs to do all of it or if he needs to do it all at once. So uh, Ryan was our caller um, last roundtable edition with 
the circus who was playing in the circus. So the dirty oh, right. diaper. Call. Yeah, the the poop bucket. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. So, but I what I responded to him basically told him this, and, and the reason I wanted to read it on the air is well because we've had quite a few people email similar type things. What I would suggest to somebody like that is that uh, they just set themselves up as a, a songwriter because he talks about setting up a publishing company and right. um, going through the business license and all that. Set yourself up as a songwriter and a publisher, but just using your own name to start things off. Mm-hmm. Because uh, if you use your own name, anything published, it, the checks will be made out to you. Then you don't have to hassle with all that other stuff, and it would just be filed. You know, Taxes would just be on a Schedule C under income that you make. So you won't have to go through as much of the, the loopholes in order to set up a business. It is kind of a pain, and I've done it before for a previous band that I was in, setting up all the account and and the the downside of it really was that if you don't make enough money, it becomes a hassle with like the state government. They start sending you like tax forms. They want you to file tax information and pay fees and for businesses and business taxes and all that. Gotcha. So it can be a lot more trouble than it's worth. So if you're just starting out, I would suggest sign up as a writer under your name, sign up as a publisher under your name. It's two separate signups, two separate entities, even though it's the same name and you're the same person and just do everything under that until things start rolling. And then you can just be a hobbyist and collect fun units. Yeah. Fun units. <laughs> Did you talk about fun units on the when we were recording, or was that before we were recording? <laughs> no, that was when we were recording. Oh, okay. That's right. People shouldn't get paid. It's just fun units. Yeah. They're having fun. They're having fun. They don't have jobs on the side. So if I go into Starbucks and it appears like the, the guys are having fun behind the counter, do I get my latte for free? You should. Okay. I'm, not, I'm working for fun units now. <laughs> we had another question from um, Earl McDonald. He basically just wanted to know um, how to... Submit your music for a Grammy nomination. Yeah, we've had a lot of uh, questions about that at CD Baby because of the Grammys were just recently. And uh, I know they have information on their website, Grammy.com. Just go there. But, you know, there are some things to remember with this. It, one, it has to be commercially released. And uh, putting your album out through CD Baby counts as that. Um, but the main thing you need to remember after you read all their guidelines is that uh, the Grammys are decided by people that are voting members of NARIS. Mm-hmm. And NARIS is comprised of people that work in the music industry. Right. So on our blog, uh, the cdbaby.org uh, site that we have here at CD Baby, I've seen some people get angry because, you know, we had a good fair amount of uh, CD Baby albums get nominated this year. People getting angry saying that, you know, um, why wasn't I nominated? Well, yeah. you're not going to be nominated if you're just sitting in your bedroom making albums. It, you got to know people. And it's not it's not necessarily that you have to be huge, but in your genre group, you have to be well-known enough for those people to take an interest in your music. So, for sure. So there is that whole aspect to it, that it's not just because you got in the list of potential nominees that you should be nominated. There, you got to know people. Got to be on their radar. Yeah, you got to be on their radar. So if you're interested in that stuff, I would go check out uh, Grammy.com and, and they'll tell you there. But uh, thanks for those emails, and we've been getting a lot of emails and calls. And um, one thing to remind you uh, with the calls is that... Um, if you're on your cell phone, it makes it hard sometimes for us to use your call. If you're walking around talking on a cell phone, sometimes it cuts out. And there's a lot of times where I get a great call and I can't use it because you're on a cell phone. So just uh, be mindful of that. The number is 206-426-5683 and uh, info at cdbabypodcast.com. Have and- we gotten any calls from the middle of band practice? No, that I'm surprised. Why doesn't anybody call us while they're at practice? <laughs> yeah, let's some tunes. But uh, also, if you have suggestions for new episodes, uh, Robert Lee King, who's become legendary in our comment section of the podcast, he actually left a bunch of good show ideas, some stuff that uh, we'll get in the works. So if you have ideas for shows, um, we'd love to hear from you because sometimes, uh, you know, we're not sure exactly what would be useful to you and we want to make sure the podcast stays relevant and uh, get you what you want. So... That being said, Chris, you've got a gig you got to get to. So I got to go collect some fun units right now. That's Rock right. And roll. <laughs> That's right. Chris is off to a, a sound check, so we got to go. So we'll catch you next time. Peace. Bye.
you, 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 you've been listening to the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast, broadcasting from Portland, Oregon, USA. 